Solving the collision response means determining the ball's velocity vector's direction and magnitude after the collision. That's what I will do in this episode and at the end the balls will be colliding following the rules of the elastic collision. To simulate the collision between two objects, I will have two physical laws as the basis of the algorithm, the conservation of momentum, which is this here, and the conservation of kinetic energy, that's this here. If the sum of the kinetic energy of the two objects remains the same after the collision, then the collision is an elastic one. And that's what I will start to implement first, and later I'm going to move on to the inelastic collisions. This one is a screenshot of the Elastic Collisions Wikipedia page here. And in this case, U means the velocity before the collision and V means the velocity after the collision. I have here the two conservation laws. This is for the kinetic energy and this is for the momentum. They are written here in a different way so that I can divide the top parts by the bottom parts. And once I do that, the result that I get will be v1 minus v2 equals u2 minus u1. And what these two expressions show is the difference in the velocities of the two objects, which is also called relative velocity. The relative velocity means how fast one object is moving relative to the other. And the equation tells me that the relative velocity of one particle with respect to the other is reversed by the collision. Then I can grab this equation and put it next to the conservation of momentum. And I don't need the masses at the moment because I haven't introduced them for the balls so that I will get these two equations. I can add them together and then the final result that I get will be V1 equals U2 and V2 equals U1. And what that means is the velocity of one object before the collision equals the velocity of the other object after the collision. Or in other words, for one dimensional case, the two objects velocities will swap after an elastic collision. And that's something I can use for the two dimensional case as well. In the two dimensional case, instead of swapping the velocity vectors, I only need to swap their component along the collision normal, which is this. So if I take the velocity vectors of the balls at the moment of the collision, this is the moment of the collision, I can split both of those vectors into two perpendicular components, one along the tangential line, the yellow here, and one along the collision normal, the orange. And the tangential component, which is parallel to the tangent at the point of the collision, we remain the same after the collision for both balls and the normal component can be handled the same way as in the one-dimensional case, which means that the normal components of the ball's velocity vectors will swap after the collision, just like they did in the one-dimensional case, while their tangential component won't change. The relative velocity of the two balls is still the difference between the two velocity vectors, just like it was in the one dimension, but while in one dimension I simply multiplied the relative velocity vectors by minus one, in two dimensions I will only need to multiply its component along the collision normal. So what I need now is the length of the relative velocity towards the direction of the normal component, and if I have a vector and I want to know its magnitude along one specific direction, then I can use the dot product again. And this here is an example, if I have the a vector and I take its dot product with the u vector, then the scalar number that I get as a result will tell me the length of the a vector's projection towards the u vector's direction. So it's, it has trigonometrical reasons. The length of this segment equals the magnitude of the a vector times the cosinus theta. Theta is the angle between the two vectors. And I can use this dot product method for the relative velocity too. So here are the two velocity vectors, v1 and v2, and the difference between them will be the relative velocity. And if I take the dot product of the relative velocity and the unit vector along the collision normal, 
then the result that I will get is the separating velocity. It's the length of the relative velocity towards the direction of the normal component. Separating velocity is a scalar, it's not a vector, but I can make a vector out of it by multiplying the unit vector along the normal by the value of the separating velocity. And the, that separating velocity vector that I get as a result, that's the one that needs to be multiplied by minus one once two balls have an elastic collision. So what I do after getting that new separating velocity vector is that I add it to the first ball's original velocity vector to get its new velocity vector and it affects the other ball towards the opposite direction. So I take the original velocity vector of the second ball and add the separating velocity vector multiplied by minus one to it. That's how I get the new velocity vector of the second ball. So according to these pictures, the first ball will move upwards after this collision and the second ball will move downwards. More or less that's what will happen. And now I try to implement this collision between two balls. I go down to the main loop and I'm going to create a new function here above that that handles the collision resolution between two balls. And I will call that function here where the collision detection function of the same two balls returns true. First, all this function does is it provides a new value to the second ball's velocity vector so that if the two balls collide, then the second ball will move a little bit to the right. The problem now is that the only place where the acceleration and velocity vectors get a new value is inside of the keyboard function here. And the keyboard function only gets called whenever the player property of the ball is true. If I want the acceleration and velocity vectors to change for every ball in every frame, then what I do first is I create a new method inside of the ball class. I call it reposition and put these lines inside. And what I also need to do now is replacing the B dot to this dot because now it's inside of the ball class. And then in the for each loop where I iterate through all the balls, I call the reposition method. And I can go back to the canvas and yes, now every time the two balls collide, then the second ball moves a little bit to the right. Now, instead of that, I would like to implement the algorithm that I was trying to explain in the beginning of the video. The first variable is the collision normal, which is a unit vector of the vector that points to the first ball center from the second ball center. This one is the relative velocity, which is the difference between the two balls velocity vectors. And the separating velocity is the dot product of the relative velocity and the collision normal. The new separating velocity, which will be useful to calculate the velocities after the collision, has the same value but with the opposite sign and the separating velocity vector is a vector that has the magnitude of the new separating velocity and points to the same direction as the collision normal. And if I add that separating velocity vector to the first ball's velocity vector and I add its opposite to the second ball's velocity vector, then I will get the new velocity vectors of the two balls. And let's take a look how it's working. And it is colliding really nicely, I think. I want to see now if the conservation of momentum is working in this case. 
So I create a function momentum display and I want to check if the sum of the two balls velocity vectors always have the same magnitude. So I add the two velocity vectors together and calculate the magnitude of the sum and I display that with the precision of 4 to this coordinate point and I also call the function after the iteration what was the name? momentum display I think I need to get rid of the friction so I can see it better and I okay it looks like the momentum after the collision is the same as before that's nice to see that really provides the illusion that the collision is realistic in the next episode I will introduce the mass and the elasticity to the balls.